Now, tell us about your long relationship with Matthew Letizia, because like him, you stayed at Southampton for your entire career, and he is very much a peer of yours. He played for nearly all of your career as well. You're, you, you overlapped with him pretty much the whole time. And he was the scorer of memorable goals, a sublime talent. What was it like taking to the field with one of the most special players in the early years of the Premier League? Oh, he, he was an absolute genius, Johnny, honestly. Uh, Matt and I were in the same year group, so we're a, bar, a few months apart. We're, we're the same age, so we, we came into the same year group, leaving school as young 16 year olds and uh you know joining on what was the old y, uh, YTS scheme youth training scheme and uh starting our apprenticeships and you know that that day-to-day -day going from training a few days a week playing a couple of games to all of a sudden the day-to-day -day, um training and and development and hopefully again realizing the dream that each and every one of us would have had. You know, it was a real strong collective group. We, we played under a youth team manager called Dave Merrington at the time, who, you know, sort of just had a real sort of knack of developing players and bringing them through. I mean, in the year group below us, there was Alan Shearer, Neil Madison, uh, the Wallace twins, Rodney and Raymond. You know, we had some real wow. top players. You know, even if it wasn't lads that went on to play for Southampton, you know, they had a lot of the guys, great careers at some level in football. And... Um, you know, there was almost a period of time where we just had a real crop of talent coming through at the club. And it's been a strength of Southampton's over the years. You know, we've seen it in more recent years. Luke Shaw, Adam Lallana, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Gareth Bale. There's been so many players that have come through the system. James Theo Walcott. Prowse, Theo Walcott as well. The, the list is endless, yeah, really. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, as we know. And, um, you know, it's, it's just been, you know, I'm proud to have been a part of that. But, you know, coming back to Matt, what a player. I mean, you know... To, to see, as you say, some of the goals that he scored up close and personal on a pitch with him and on the training ground day in, day out <laughs> when we used to work together was a privilege because there was no better player that I actually played with or possibly even against maybe. You know, he was just that good. Do you remember there was a particular game in the 92-93 season against Newcastle United and they were in their pomp with Gino Lara and... Andy Cole and Peter Beardsley and uh, Philippe Albert, really good, lovely team. Kevin Keegan as manager. And <laughs> Letizia scored two of the best goals in the history of the Premier League within an hour of each other. Yeah, I, I was playing in the game. Yes, Johnny, you were, and, weren't uh, you? I remember. I think, you know, it's, from what I remember of it, you know, my memory is not as good as Matt's. He, he seems to recall every single detail <laughs> um, and, and, you know, all credit to him because he scored so many goals. I only scored the one, so it's, it's easy for You me only to scored one goal, one. Francis. <laughs> one in nearly 400 appearances. Was it a left footed shot? I hope it was. Well, being a, a left footer, you, you maybe imagine so, no, but it was a, a header from a Matt Letizia <laughs> Oh, really? Perfect. And it was, of course, he was a great passer. It was straight, it was a gift. Yeah, he made and, it easy for me. Made and was it, it at the far me. post as well? It was, yeah. It, was it has to be. Quite a, a strange tight angle against Leicester City at the Dell um, in the late 90s or mid to late 90s. So, um, yeah, at least I got that one. But, but Matt's were, were just incredible. And those two against Newcastle, as you say, were quite ridiculous in many ways. <laughs> the way that he just flicked over a few players and calmly just slotted it in the back of the net. And the other one was, I think, just a, a thigh and a volley um, yeah. over the goalkeeper. And, yeah, I mean, that's... The type of goals he scored, you know, he he could do those kind of outrageous kind of finishes that, you know, it's one thing attempting them or even being able to see them in your mind, but to actually execute them the way that he did just goes to show how good he was. You see, I think Southampton don't get the justice, don't get the reputation that they deserve you know, everyone talks about the West Ham Academy or the style of the West Ham play. And, you know, everyone talks about Newcastle being, a, you know, a footballing city and everyone's mad in Newcastle about football. So Southampton, you know, and Southampton have been at the business end of football now since about 1976, since they won the FA Cup. And it really changed that football club. And I think in the early 80s, when they were championship runners up to Liverpool, and they had that mad team of Keegan and Ball and Shannon and 
think um, uh, McMenemy was manager. I mean, there was a, a Shilton in goal. So, what a team! An all stars. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that you know, for for a certain generation, and I include myself in this, uh, an era as you say, sort of in the the early eighties, just seeing those kind of players. And I think that was the the the, the the thing that Laurie McMenemy did well, wasn't it? He got that balance between bringing in sort of players that a lot of clubs may have seen as being right at the tail end of their careers and maybe no real use to a certain point. He seemed to sort of get an extra two, three, four seasons out of them. I mean, you look at some of the players we had, you mentioned some of them there, you know, it was like Keegan, Shannon, Ball, Shilton. We had Joe Jordan down here, Frank Worthington down here. Jimmy Case was a player that was a skipper in the team that I came into as a youngster with many other of the young lads that was just the daddy of the team, you know, with along of, with a few other senior players. And, and always having that balance of the experience with the youngsters and the youth coming through was something that Samson have done very well over yeah. the years and, and almost a, in a similar kind of position to that again where they are today now. Now, two people I've come to know well in football, one's still with us, not very well, unfortunately, and... One is sadly no longer with us. Former Aston Villa captain Chris Nicholl, who I think was Southampton manager for five years and did very, very well. Uh, a great wit, a uh, great sense of humour and, and a good leader. And, of course, he had to manage Ball and Shannon and Keegan. And, you know, he was a decent player himself, but he wasn't an England player. He was a Northern Irish player, in fact. And then the great Alan Ball, who... <laughs> his major tactic, I think, was basically to tell all the other players to just give the ball to Matt Letizia. That was your tactic, wasn't it? <laughs> he, 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 said, he told me that. Yeah, no, most, you, you're right, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> and Chris Nichol was, was, was the manager who signed me as a pro. Was it really? Uh, and, yeah. And, a good and man. My day with the team, you know, an, an absolute lovely man. He's, he's down here on the South Coast now. And, and I know he's got that Aston Villa connection, who's, who's your team, you know, what a player he was, you know, he, uh, he, was, a, he was a tough, tough man, you know, as, a, as a, a young apprentice at the club at the time. I remember him joining in training sessions and kicking lumps out of me and the other young guys. I think it was to, to sort of see how, how we'd react and, and, and what we had about us. Um, but, yeah, such a, such a lovely man and somebody that comes along to watch some of the ex-Saints games now and every single one of us that, that, that have known him or played for him as a player, um, just a delight to just have a great respect for him he's, oh so much respect yeah. so much respect and you know he's he's with us unlike alan ball the other manager yeah, you mentioned shame. um again what a what a passionate man you know just oozed an enthusiasm about football that just couldn't help rub off on you and they, you know as a, a former world cup winner walking through the door johnny you know he just amazing. commanded that respect from all of us and what, what a man, what a player. And you, you're right, that, what you mentioned about him and Matt Patizier and how we were going to go about things, that is what he said on his first day at training. Do you know what? That's so funny. Um, Chris and Alan have both told me an anecdote related to Sir Alf. And that idea of, when you get the ball, give it to Matt Letizier, was precisely what Sir Alf Ramsey told him in the 66 World Cup run. When you get the ball, give it to Bobby Charlton. That was where he got that from. And Chris Nichols it told him. Yeah, it was. He told yeah, me. Yeah, it must have been. And Chris Nichols yeah, said to me, he, he walked into the dressing room and he saw Keegan and Ball and Shannon and uh, oh, and Shilton. And, oh, how am I going to manage these guys? I'm, you know. And so he said, he said, Sir Alf Ramsey told him, he said, always stand in the corner of a room. You know, get in the corner of the room because that way <laughs> no one can talk behind your back. <laughs> and that apparently is where you'll probably tell me. Did he make all his sort of team announcements and throwing the teacups around at half time from the corner of the room? Oh, well, the, the, the dressing room at the Dale, the home dressing room, was um, there, there was a table in, 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 not in the middle of the room, but yeah. to one side a little bit. And um, there was no windows in the dressing room. You know, it was an old stadium and yeah. there was one little skylight, I think. And if, if it was dark, um, you know, it could be almost like pitch black. You couldn't see anything in there. And uh, I do remember Chris sort of and Alan Ball, you know, during their times as manager, getting pretty feisty and, um, shall we say, quite explosive. But, uh, you know, they were just so passionate about the sport and wanted us to do well that, you know, there was a few few occasions where we probably deserved it, I would imagine. <laughs> Excellent. I, 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 and I'm sure that was... Uh... 
I'm sure that was well received by a good bunch of pros. Uh, let me ask you, because you did play between 88 and 2004 alongside Matt Letizia, one of the great beneficiaries of the new Premier League era. I remember the Dell, uh, that very funny um, sort of end out a goal where the, where, the, where the stadium just sort of flew downwards. It was like a sort of, a, what's that? I don't quite know that design, but it was an open it, top. It was a steep slope, wasn't it? It was a slope for no reason. Uh, but, behind it. Johnny, yeah. there was a road that was on an angle behind the stadium, so they couldn't have a, a proper, you know, yeah. stadium. It had to be like a cheese wedge shape. Yeah, which, uh, it's a bit like the whole tent at with. Villa Park. It's it's a world famous uh, sports tent, but it, it it does that because um, the road behind it um, is built that way, and uh, it's always had that funny shape. If you look at Aston Villa over a hundred years, it's always the whole tent's always been straight on one side, and a sort of cheese wedge on the other side. But right. St Mary's was purpose-built, and I was told once that it's the same design as Pride Park, Derby County. D where did you prefer playing? The Dell with all its sort of atmosphere and its style and, and home of the 76 uh, FA Cup winners and, of course, the 83 runners-up or the St Mary's, the purpose-built kind of thing uh, that you played in? Yeah, I, I, I think as a player that played the bulk of my career at the Dell, I've, I've clearly got a soft spot, like many of us did, I think, of playing at the Dell at the time. It was one of those unique uh, older stadiums that just had a unique atmosphere. And especially if it was a game under lights, I think anyone that watches a game under, you know, floodlights, it, it, there seems to be a different kind of atmosphere. And, and the Dell certainly had that. And the proximity of the crowd to the pitch, you know, it was literally just a matter of yards. It wasn't like the modern stadiums now oh, or yeah. like St Mary's. Um, I was part of the squad that made that transition from the Dell to St Mary's. And to be honest, we did struggle for quite some time before yeah. we really found our feet in a new stadium, a new home. We were so used to knowing every quirky inch and foot of that old ground that was just a real benefit to us as a team and as a club for many years that when we made that transition, it, it was quite a tough one looking yeah. back on it. But, you know, we soon found our feet and it's taken, uh, you know, a while to to establish them ourselves there. But now we're in a state-of-the-art modern stadium, which is uh, we're seeing more and more of in football now, as we know. Yeah, a real credit to the city and, of course, Southampton back in the Premier League and being back there for some time. Now, you have raised more than a million pounds for cancer research. That is an incredible number. And you've completed five Ironman challenges. What's been the toughest challenge post-football for you, Francis? Oh, wow. Uh, if, if you're referring to the, the, the three challenges that I took on in recent years, the, the first one was running anything between 40 and 50 miles a day every day for three weeks when I ran toward the Premier League stadiums in 2014. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Followed that up by adding a second discipline, the bike, where I ran a marathon every morning with a minimum of 75 miles on the bike every day for two weeks going to the championship clubs and Premier League grounds. And then the last one was attempting seven Ironmans in seven days and um, I got withdrawn by the, the lady that was looking after me um, as a physio uh, on the morning of day five.